Uh, it, it has been a, a week here at the church. Anybody notice a few things different around here? Um, last Monday morning, there was tractors here ripping out concrete, and uh, Friday afternoon, we had five cement trucks come. 50 yards of, anybody who does concrete knows that's a lot of concrete. Um, but I got to tell you, um, they were both in first service, but I do want to shout out to, to California Arborist and the Schwarzbach family for their partnership in that. And then also Dave and Yvette Harless and their company, um, uh, Service Pump uh, Cement Pumping. Um, between all of them and Pastor Greg and a few others, I mean, we, they just made it happen. So a uh, huge, huge effort. And then uh, we are in the process of hanging that cross right there up there. Um, now let me tell you a story really quick. Um, how many of you know your pastor is horribly afraid of heights? Yeah. Heights, coyotes, and cockroaches. The only thing three things I'm afraid of. Nothing else scares me. You could walk in with a gun around. I wouldn't be afraid. But a coyote, come out, I'm out. Cockroach, I'm out. Well, that's 22 feet up, that bracket right there. 22 feet. And so we, that's two stories, right? We put the ladder up. There's a guy in the church that says, Pastor, I know you're afraid of heights. I got this. He goes up about five rungs and goes, nope. <laughs> so guess who put that up? <laughs> Fifteen times up and down a ladder on Wednesday afternoon to mount that about 20-pound uh, bracket up there. Um, and then it came time to put the cross up, and I just said, no. <laughs> No more. My legs still hurt from going up and down that ladder. So if you are strong and young and don't mind going up a ladder, I need about four guys Wednesday night. Um, if you have a 20-foot extension ladder, that would be great. We do have one at the church, but we could probably use another one. We do have a rope and pulley system that's going to help pull it up there. But we need some guys with courage to, to go up those ladders and put some bolts in. And next Sunday... Even Friday night, at Good Friday, you will see that up there. All right? So Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. I need, I need a, few, a few guys, okay? Um, don't make your pastor go up that ladder again. <laughs> I don't know if my legs could do it. Um, it, is, it is Palm Sunday. Let me help you see the rhythm here. Um, Palm Sunday is when Jesus is entering into Jerusalem um, getting ready to do, quite honestly, the greatest act in human history, the most selfless act in all of human history, laying your life down on a cross for the sacrifice of the sins of the world, the greatest act in human history. He is now entering into Jerusalem for that to happen. Uh, Thursday is what we call Maundy Thursday. Maundy Thursday is when Jesus would sit at the, the Passover meal um, for the last time with his disciples. It's when... Um, Judas leaves to betray him. It's when Peter is just stupid. Um, it's that, all that happens on Thursday, and then Friday is when Jesus hangs on the cross. Sunday is when he res resurrects from the grave. So that's the rhythm of all of this week um, that's taking place. In the past, we've done Passover meals. We'll probably do one again uh, maybe next year or the year after. Um, it's very ritualistic and fun if you've never been through one before um, but you got to like lamb um, because he was the sacrificial lamb that's part of the Passover meal um, but Thursday uh, excuse me Friday we will have a night of worship uh, let me let me just tell you just kind of the philosophy behind the Friday night night of worship um, I tell our worship team all the time don't remind me I'm a sinner on Sunday I don't want to I want to be reminded that in Christ I can beat my sin Right? How many of you know in Christ, whatever it is you face, you can win? I don't want to be reminded that my sin makes me pathetic and weak and, and a loser. All right? I want to be reminded that in Christ I have the victory. But on Good Friday, I want to be reminded. I, I want to be reminded of my failures and choices and the, the price that Jesus paid for that. That at the cross, my story changed because of the death that Jesus Christ went through for me. And so, uh, Good Friday, we've got a lot of great things planned in our night of worship. We'll take communion together. Um, but all, most of the songs tonight, that night will be reflection around the cross and forgiveness and, and hope. Um, and we'll end on just a great note of gratitude uh, for what Christ has done for us. So that's Good Friday. Um, and then Easter Sunday is coming. We'll have some announcements about that. Um, but I need you to do two things, church, when it comes to Good Friday, or excuse me, when it comes to next weekend. Two things. You ready? Number one, invite somebody to come with you. 
Let's double our attendance on, on Easter Sunday. Uh, we had 313 people here for a funeral yesterday. Um, we had them shoved in every nook and cranny, every corner. We had 52 people in overflow watching it online in the, in the fellowship hall. Let's do that next Sunday. That will be awesome. Um, number two, it is supposed to pour rain next weekend. So I need you to pray because the guy who creates weather can move weather. Um, and so let's pray. Otherwise, your kids are going to be uh, looking for Easter eggs in a mud field, um, messing up all of their fancy, fancy Easter clothes. Um, we are already talking through a plan B, but let's pray we don't need plan B, that we keep plan A. Because by the way, when we tell you where you're going to have to park, you don't want to do that in the rain. Um, but you will. So, <laughs> yeah, amen, amen. A little rain doesn't hurt you, right? People in the Northwest know what rain is. We don't. Um, so as we get into the, the scripture this morning, we're going to get into Luke 19 in just a minute. Let me, let me just kind of tell you what, what's kind of happening in the air at this moment, um, in, in time. Not, not this moment, but in, in, when Jesus is getting ready to enter into Jerusalem. Most of the time in the scripture, when, um, when a crowd gathers around Jesus, Jesus disappears quietly. Most of the time when Jesus does a miracle, he'll tell people this, hey, hey, just keep this to yourself. Don't, don't, don't let anybody know. Jesus is kind of flying under the radar most of his life. And now all of a sudden, we get to the triumphal entry, and all of a sudden, he shifts a little bit. And he starts saying, hey, go get that donkey for me. Hey, um, there's going to be a crowd gathered, and he welcomes the cheers of the crowd. And he's, he's setting up what he knows is his final act as a human and as God. And that is the cross. He's, he's setting it all up. In fact, you, you don't need to turn there. I'll read it to you. But in, in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, it says this, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming uh, to you. He is righteous and he is victorious. And yet he is humble, riding on a donkey. So now, um, that's Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus actually enters into Jerusalem. And I'm going to read you the version out of, out of the book of Luke, uh, chapter 19. It says, after telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples, and as he came to the, pa- to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent his two disciples ahead. And he said, go into that village over there, he told them, and as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying that colt, just say, the Lord needs it. And so they went and they found a colt, and just as Jesus had said, sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked him, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. Okay, so let me help you do this um, and understand what this is. I need you all, when you're driving home from church today, to stop at whatever car uh, dealership you pass. And I need you to ask them which one of those cars has never been driven before. And then I need you to tell them uh, to give you the keys because the Lord needs it. (laughs) I'll come visit you in jail. But that's literally what happens. Go grab that donkey that's never been ridden, and if they ask you, just say, the Lord needs it. Well, the Lord needs it, right? Next time I get pulled over for speeding, well, the Lord told me to, right? And so they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their garments over it for him to ride on. And as he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached a place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, All of his followers began to shout and began to sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles that they had seen. Blessing on the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. And Jesus replied, If they keep quiet, the stones along the road will burst into tears. 
But as he came closer to Jerusalem and as he saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against you, and your walls will encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you, and your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. I I gave this message this morning a title, and I'm calling it A Shirt, A Shout, and a Tear. A Shirt, A Shout, and a Tear. I don't know about you, but I began to think about if I were getting ready to enter into doing the single greatest act in all of human history. If I was coming into town to do the most significant thing on the planet ever, like how would I enter? A couple weeks ago I was driving home from a meeting. I was driving down Glen Oaks Boulevard up in Glendale and a brand new Rolls Royce pulled up next to me. I I don't know what kind it was, but I I was in my truck, and it was as big as my truck, and it was gorgeous. All black, blacked out, black tinted windows, 22-inch wheels, and I I was cruising along this thing for a few minutes, and I was like, that's how I'd roll. That's how I'd roll. And then I I got out my phone, and, and I Googled, like, hey, what Rolls Royce is this? And basically, here's what Rolls Royce said back to me. If you have to ask how much, you can't afford it anyways. <laughs> right? I mean, Rolls-Royce, if you go to their website, don't even put their prices on there. In fact, you don't even get to like build, you know, like you can go to Honda, you can build your car, and then they'll tell you how much it, You don't get to do that with Rolls-Royce. They interview you whether you're good enough for their car. I, I didn't even pass like question one. And I began to think like, how would I enter if I was coming in to the, do the single most greatest act in all of human history, I want you to see a video because this, in my mind, is how I would enter the town. Oh, I'm rolling into town right there, right? (laughs) Ready or not. (laughs) And yet the reality is Jesus didn't roll into town in a Rolls Royce. He didn't roll into town with thunderous music and hype. He comes in on a donkey. A donkey. See, in in, by biblical times... Only the wealthy, only the powerful, only those who wanted to be noticed, only those who wanted position and influence, they were the only ones who rode horses. But servants, beasts of burden, were the ones that came in on donkeys. And Christ chose to come in on a donkey. A donkey is a symbol of service, it's a symbol of peace, and it's a symbol of humility. And so while today... I would probably roll in in that Rolls Royce that I saw. Jesus would probably roll in in a Honda. The most significant act in all of human history. But what I want to talk to you about a little bit is 
A lot of times the Bible gives you a random thought or a random fact, and you have to ask yourself, why would the Bible put this random fact in? And so one of the random facts that just caught my attention this time was this, that as the disciples bring the donkey to Jesus, they do this. They take off their garments. And not only do they cover the donkey with it, but they also lay it down in front of Jesus as he, as he enters in. I, I don't know about you. Pastor Dave, did anybody lay their garments down for you today? Because you're not Jesus. <laughs> Pretty close, though. Yeah. They, they laid their garments down in front of Jesus. They laid their garments over, over the donkey. And that has to do with submission and it has to do with authority. I want, I want to read you a quote that I came across and just see if this resonates with you a little bit. It says, this one act... Laying down your garments. This one act demonstrates their willingness to set aside, um, excuse me, demonstrates their willingness to set self aside and serve, submit, and support the mission of Jesus, even if it meant giving up their own possessions and comfort. Did you catch that? This one act demonstrates their willingness to set aside self serve, submit, and support the mission of Jesus, even if it means giving up their own possessions and their own comfort. And my question to you is this, where are you laying down your shirt? Where are you placing your garments? And then it says that as they entered in, as Jesus enters in, the the crowd begins to shout and they begin to sing and they say things like blessing and peace and glory. But what caught me this week is this, that they're shouting these things to Christ. And the Bible tells us this, because of what they had seen him do. And it's interesting that it's real easy for me to praise the Lord when he does something for me. But in this particular case, they're praising him for what they have seen him do in others. I have seen Jesus do this. And because of that, I am shouting and I am singing. I am shouting and I'm singing because of what God, I have seen God do. There's a song by Brandon Lake and Cody Carnes. If you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend whatever stream you listen to. Just type in the song, Too Good to Not Believe. Too Good to Not Believe. Let me read you the bridge on that song. It says, we've seen cancer disappear. We've seen broken bodies healed. Don't tell me he can't do it. We've seen real life resurrection. We've seen mental health restored. Don't you tell me he can't do it. We've seen families reunited. We've seen prodigals return. We've seen troubled souls delivered. We've seen addicts set free. Don't tell me he can't do it. We'll see cities in revival. We'll see salvation flood the streets. We'll see his glory fill the nation like the world has never seen. Don't tell me he can't do it because I know he can when it comes to the crowd praising and shouting, the scripture tells us this, they're, they're shouting and singing for what they have seen him do. And I began to think about in my own life the things that I've literally seen with my own eyes. I was in Bible college. I prayed for a young man. His leg grew two inches. I watched his leg grow. Watched it. I've seen it. I can tell you in this audience how many ladies were told by doctors you will not give birth to a child and they have babies in the nursery right now. I've seen it. I've seen marriages that stood in front of us said, Pastor, we're done. We hate each other. Our marriage is in the pits and we prayed and they worked and they're sitting in this audience today. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen cancer healed. I've seen it. I've seen people where doctors said, you've only got this much time to live, and yet they're still alive today. I've seen it. I've seen addicts who've said, Pastor, I can't quit this. I've seen them quit. I've seen Jesus do it. And because of that, it makes it real easy for me to shout and real easy for me to sing. Real easy for me. I thought it would be fun this morning if we just hit, had a moment where you could share with us things that you've seen. What have you seen Jesus do? What have you seen 
with your own eyes. And I'm going to give you a minute. I just want you to shout it out. Shout it out. I've, I've seen Jesus do this. We had some great stories in first service. And so my question is, what have you seen? Go ahead and just somebody shout out. What have you seen Jesus do? Okay. Job restored. Job restored. Somebody else. Okay, one at a time. <laughs> the rent was paid. Somebody else over here. Family restored. Somebody else. Peace. Peace. Somebody else. Healing. Healing. Somebody else. Free from alcohol. Free from alcohol. Come on. Somebody else. Huh? Wombs opened. Housing. Housing. Say it again. Improved vision. Amen. Amen. Somebody else. Came back from the dead. Come on. Don't tell me he can't do it. And you know what? When you get around people who will say, this is the miracle that God did for me, it makes it real easy to shout, doesn't it? Makes it real easy to sing. So church, I know that uh, Bailey already had you do it, but will you do it for me again? For these things that were just shared by our own church family, can we just give a huge shout out to Jesus? Somebody just give a hallelujah, clap your hands, shout something. Come on. Now here's the thing. If you don't do that, you're going to get replaced by a rock. And I don't want a rep rock replacing me. And so church, let me ask you just this question. Are you silencing your shout? Are you silencing your song? And lastly is, is a tear. See, Jesus enters Jerusalem and he weeps. And the reason he weeps is because he says this, you'll never know the way to peace. You'll never know the way to peace. And what's interesting to me when I began to read that is literally two verses above that, the crowd is shouting peace to Jesus and two verses later, Jesus is weeping because people will not know peace. He's weeping because they'll not know peace. And here's what it comes over to. I was here like the peace I give, the world can't give. I'm here among you and you rejected me. And because of that, you'll never know peace. You'll never know peace. And you all know this, right? There is a peace that Jesus gives that the world can't give. John 14 tells us that. And you can try. You've seen it. Your friends, your family members. You can try to find peace in a bottle. You can try to find it in a pill. You can try to find it in adrenaline. You can try to find it. But unless you know Jesus, you will not know peace. And so Jesus weeps over that. He literally, three times in the Bible is recorded that Jesus weeps. Three times. One of them is for people who will never know peace. Because they rejected him. You'll never, you'll never know peace. And my question is this. What do you weep over? See, I truly believe this. That God has given every single person in this room a holy passion for something. God knows every single need in this world. And he's given somebody a passion to meet that need. If I was God, I would do it different, but thankfully I'm not. I don't know that I would use people, but God does. And here's the good news. He just uses average, ordinary, broken people. And one of the things that I am absolutely convinced of is this. The Bible is clear that the role of the church is to do three things. Number one is to reach the lost. That's next Sunday, by the way. It's one of the ways we do that. Number two is we're to make disciples. We've talked about that a lot, being on being, having the character and mission of Jesus. And number three is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So part of my job is to teach you to do my job. So would anybody like to come on up and finish this this morning? <laughs> Mark, you ready? You come on up. Now here's the thing. You might not ever walk up on stage, but can I tell you that this part is only about this much of my job. See, I, I get to walk out there 
I think 8,000 steps the other day of guys putting concrete in. I get to sit with some of you over a meal and find out the things that are breaking your heart, and I partner with you in prayer. Uh, I get to, to walk over the victories of life when some of you uh, show me your newborn baby, and then I, have to be, I get to be in the room with you when you say goodbye to loved ones. Do you know all of you could do that part of my job? And God has given you a passion for it. God has given you a passion for it. And what has God given you a holy passion for? What, what moves you? For some of you, it's injustice. For some, it's grief. Some, it's addiction. Some, it's single moms. Some, it's disaster relief. Some, it's the unborn. For some, it's the unhoused. Robin has a huge heart for the foster care system. What hits your heartstrings? What hits your heartstrings? And, and my question, and we're going to end in just a minute with this, is how do you turn your weeping into your ministry how do you turn your weeping into your ministry the very thing that God has given you a special heart for how do you turn that into something where you can make a difference And so if I'm to equip the saints for the work of the ministry let me tell you what ministry is it's, my definition is pretty simple ministry is to see a need and meet it so when you see maybe the, the elderly who's maybe struggling with their, their grocery cart get to their car and you stop and you help them that's called ministry Right? When you are driving down the road and you see somebody who's got a flat tire or car trouble and you, you stop and help them, that's called ministry. And, and so how do you turn your, your passion, your weeping, how do you turn that into ministry? I, I love it because I, I shared a story in first service, but I'm going to share you a different story in this service because in first service was Kathy Maxinoff. And if you don't know who Kathy Maxinoff is, you'll know this. Kathy raises guide dogs. And right now she's got a dog named Skip. He even has his own Instagram page. <laughs> and, and Skippy, who's a baby Labrador, but already about this big, will one day be a guide dog. And so we were talking because um, Kathy was my neighbor when my kids were little. And Kathy used to sneak my son to the fish store. And he would come home with a new fish tank and all kinds of fish. And she never asked our permission. <laughs> you know how many animals I got from Kathy? But we were talking, and she said, Pastor, that, that was my story. Because when I gave my life to Jesus, I had a love for animals and a love for people, and God had showed me how to put both of them together. I think she's raised nine. And she raises them and to give them away. And she began even after first service to recount to me where some of her dogs are. And most of them, I've, I've been there when she's raised them. And she said, oh, one of our veterans who was actually in Saddam Hussein's home when they caught him, but who was shot. That dog is now a care dog, comfort. Um, she's got dogs that she's raised that sense when your blood sugar is low for those who are diabetic and can alert you. She's raised dogs for people in wheelchairs that know how to open doors and turn on lights and put on your saw. I'm trying to teach my dog how to do that. <laughs> but you know what she did? She took the passion that she had, the thing that broke her heart, and she turned it into a ministry. And so how do you turn the thing that's God broken your heart over, the thing that you're passionate about, how do you turn that into a ministry? I'm going to give you some tips, some steps along the way. Um, number one, how do you turn your passion into your ministry? Number one, start with prayer. Start with prayer. Um, God, how, where, when. Um, I've shared with you before. I have, to, I have to qualify this every time. It's not today. Don't ask me. Don't try to help me start it. It's, I'm not ready yet. Um, I have so much on my plate right now. But one day, I'm going to start a ministry that refurbishes bicycles, strollers, and, and wheelchairs for people who can't afford them. That's a dream in my heart. One day, not tomorrow, okay? I shared that story for the first time about eight years ago in this church. A lady in the church said, Pastor, you need to, you need to talk to this guy. And, um, and so I got a phone call, and he said, Listen, um, I'm the only bicycle dealer allowed to sell bikes on the USC campus. 
I sell thousands of bicycles to USC students. The campus is so big, they all ride bicycles to and from. And he said, but part of that contract is I also have to get rid of the bicycles that students leave um, when they move away. How many of you know a lot of times college students leave school, they leave everything? Not if you're in my income bracket, but in other income brackets, right? And so he said, here's what I want you to do. I heard you want to start this ministry. If you will get a truck and you'll get all those bicycles, they're all yours. But it's about 1,500 to 2,000 bicycles. I don't know where to put those bicycles. I told Robin, you can, we can move out of our house. We can store them there. She wasn't going for that at all. Um, and I just had to say, you know what? I'm not, I'm not ready yet. I'm still not ready yet. There will come a day. But I'm letting God still build that dream. To still build that dream. He's putting pieces slowly together with it. And so start with prayer. Number two, write what you hear God speaking to you and share it. Sorry, that's number three. Number two, just write what God, you hear God speaking to you. Number three, meet with someone, maybe a pastor, and share your dream and ask them to pray. Here's what I, God's put in my heart. What do you think? Will you pray with me about this? Number four, ask God for the right connections and open doors. Ask God for the right connections and open doors. Number five, walk in the spirit and in discernment. Discernment said you don't need $1,500 bicycles right now. And number six, dream big, but start small. Dream big, but start small. See, I believe Jesus wept over a passion that he had for people to know peace. And he was weeping because people were choosing to reject the peace that he could offer them. But I also believe this. Jesus is putting something in your heart that breaks it. And maybe it's injustice. Maybe it's disaster relief. Maybe it's unwed mothers. Maybe it's the addict. I, I don't know. But how do you turn that thing that Jesus has put in your heart into action where we see a need and we meet it and we start a ministry? So will you... Close your eyes as we pray this morning. Pastor, or, uh, excuse me, Greg Gunderson, I think, is uh, coming up on the guitar. And I'm just going to ask if you're here this morning and say, Pastor, I have a dream. I don't have the whole picture yet, but I, I, I have. I know. As soon as you said, there's a holy passion, you, you, you knew. And all I'm asking this morning, if you're willing to say, God, start directing my steps. Start showing me which way to walk. Start, start walking me through the right doors. Start connecting me with the right people. If that's you, will you raise your hand so that I can pray for you? Anyone would say, I've got that. I've got that. I see the hands all over the room. And so, Father, I, I cast these in front of you. Lord, that we, we start with number one, and that is, Lord, would you begin to show us the way? Lord, would you begin to refine and clarify what it is you're asking of us. Would you begin, Lord, to introduce us to the right people? Would you begin, Lord, to give us dreams and desires? Lord, would you begin to show us the way? Because I know this, God, if it is your dream, you'll make it happen and we'll just enjoy the journey. So, Lord, put the right people in place. Begin to expand their vision. Bring confirmation every step of the way, and bring provision, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, something that really impacted me was the reminder of how important peace is. Even the funeral yesterday, if you talk to Jerry, the overwhelming amount of peace that she has felt. I bet you if you, we took a second, and if you've, if you've ever experienced the peace that the scripture talks about that's beyond understanding, would you put your hand in the air? It, it's something that the world has no idea about, but it's, it's what sets our relationship with Jesus apart from any other. So I wanted to take a minute. I'm imagining with the amount of people that are in this room, there's someone here that might really need to know what that peace is and yeah. know the Prince of Peace. So will you take a minute, will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Believers, would you be praying with 
um, with us this morning that the Holy Spirit would move into the lives of those people that are here. If you're here today and you've never really said yes to Jesus, or maybe you've you said it, but it was so long ago, and you want to really dive back into that relationship with him. If you want to know the Prince of Peace this morning, would you put your hand in the air? I would love to have a chance to pray with you this morning. Anyone? Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else that wants to join this lovely one? All right. Everyone that knows Jesus, will you repeat this? with us and my friend this morning, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me of all my sins. I believe that you died. I believe that you died. And rose again. And rose again. So that I could live for you. So that I could live for you. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. So that I can know. So that I can know. Serve and follow you, always. follow you always. I give you my life today. Thank you for this new life. In Jesus' name we all said, amen. 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 Well, next Sunday is Easter. I will promise you it's going to be a packed house, both services. So you'll want to plan ahead. Um, we are asking that you sort of reserve our best parking places for our guests. And so how many of you count your steps? How many of you like open your phone to see? Oh, come on. How many I of you do. have Fitbit and Apple? See, come on. Come on. Um, I'm going to tell you how to get 664 steps next week. How many? Oh, 664. Um, we have reserved the parking lot. You're going to see uh, somebody driving there at um, the Lowell Joint School District just down the street. It is 331 steps. Um, from there to here. Um, so I will get you 660 steps if you park there. We also have a shuttle that will be running. So if you park there and you don't want to walk 330 steps, maybe it might be raining, um, we will have a shuttle that will pick Look you up. Look at his speed walking. Dave can speed walk. Um, you didn't know it was a power walk, did you? Yep. Look, at, look he just passed the... the um, the offices, and now he's going to, you'll recognize this when you go. And then here's that housing track. Right yeah. after the housing track is the school next door. Wait, watch, a, a, a car almost hits him coming oh, out no. of the school. <laughs> Ready? Watch, watch. So here it comes. The here it comes right there. Oh, there it is. <laughs> and there's the church. See, it's not that far. It's just before Laughing Well Look, at Dave walked it in like eight seconds. I know. So uh, you, you can do it. Um, but, uh, we really need you to, to try to do that. We'll have a shuttle available also. We would love it if some of our first-time guests would pull in and be able to easily find a spot. Wouldn't that be great? So those of you that can, if you don't mind, just make it a, a point to... Well, and remember, church, there. we will also have a special adult hunt next week between yes. services. And the only thing that we're going to tell you is you've got to follow us on social media to know what it is. Ooh. So the Warehouse OC on Instagram, um, follow that. Those of you online, the Warehouse OC on Instagram, uh, follow that. We've got, it, it's actually really kind of fun. So uh, adults, so they'll have yes. something to do yes. as well. Now, we really, really, I know you've heard us say this week after week, so forgive me for going at it again, but we need all hands on deck. So if you don't mind, if you stop in the lobby on your way out, there's a serve card. We actually would love to challenge any of you. We call it serve one, sit one. And so that means that you come, you work one of them, helping the kids, because we usually have millions of kids, and then the next one you can just kind of chill, hang back, and enjoy a service. So if you don't mind filling out a welcome, or sorry, a serve card, you can drop it in the offering little box as you walk out. We also have these two. You've seen these. Um, all month we've been putting them on your chairs. They're in the lobby. This is my husband's preference, small invite card. This is, has a little bit nicer detail. But both of those, there's plenty in the lobby. Grab one, grab two. Do like our missionary said, step out of the box. Also, if you're watching online, you can forward anything we've got on social media, do a screenshot and forward that out. Let's, let's inundate our social media with invites to come next week. Sound good? Will you stand with us as we close? 
Go ahead and grab the hand of your neighbor, if you will. Remember that church is people. So when we talk about the church, we're talking about you. It's how you serve. It's how you make a difference. It's how you take those passions that God has given you. It's how you invite people to join you. Everyone in this room came because somebody invited them at one point or another. And so be great this week, church, at being the hands and feet of Jesus. Be kind, be compassionate, be loving. If you're strong and don't mind heights, show up at Wednesday and (laughs) help me put that cross up. But until then, uh, God bless you. Have a great week. See you next Sunday or good Friday. Take care.